You're listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I got to tell you something, people. I'm really irritated at Facebook. Now, it's not their problem, but for some reason, they have a function where if you look like somebody, you will get something called a photo review. So you get that. Now, in the last two days, I've gotten five photo reviews, and over the last month, I've got about 20, because for some reason, people think I look like Steve Mnuchin. Now, if you see Mnuchin in the press conferences, he has black hair, he has full black hair, I am completely bald, I look nothing like him, but since last night, five photo reviews. Anyway, we have a great show today. We have a friend of mine. He's, uh, he's a great drummer. And, uh, you know, one of my uh, a band I love. He's also he started a Philadelphia super group, and he plays in something called the Bar Band. And he's an Eagles fan, and he's a great guy. My guest is Dave Second. And how you doing, Dave? I'm doing well, Steve. How are you doing? Good. You know, I now you know me. <laughs> I, other other than dodging the uh, Steve Mnuchin lookalike uh, <laughs> uh, category, I mean that's kind of funny. You know, and I don't think you look like him, but I kind of, you know, he wears glasses, he wears glasses, maybe somehow that, you know, attributes to the lookalike thing, but, you know, hey, look, um, you know, he's sitting in the hot spot, isn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I, I told my wife, I said, if we still lived in L.A. and they were shooting live uh, TV shows, I could be on, I could get a wig and go on, like, Kimmel or, or any of those yeah. shows, be an impersonator, there but it, it's just there funny because it's there crazy. You. So now there we're... <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I lost, I lost you for a second oh. there, see. Okay, well, we were talking, uh, or before we got on the phone, we were talking about the news and how you're a glutton for punishment. What? Why yeah. Why do you watch the news all yeah. the time? Well, I, I'll tell you, you know, I, uh, I, you know, look, I said, I'm, you know, I get up in the morning, I see the news, and right now, you know, you put on the news, and it's nothing but, you know, bad news. Um, it's rough, but that. You know, and I guess a bit of a glutton for punishment because I know that's what's coming and I just keep watching. And I think that's just kind of, uh, you know, um, my father would always watch the news. And and uh, even though it's been, you know, he passed away some years ago, but I, you know, it's just something that I've gotten from him where I'm always just, I just watch the news, good or bad, you know, I just want to know what's happening. And um, I, I've, I've never been able to say, look, you know, Oh, I, 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 I can't watch it. Um, I guess it doesn't make me feel bad enough to turn away from it. That's never happened yet, but it's getting close. Now, how are you holding up with this? I mean, you're a musician. You know, you're you're yeah. you can you can work out of your house, but you know, you, the Hooters are about to go on a tour this summer. You know, you guys yeah. bring so much joy. What is that like as a musician to sit there and all of a sudden your calendar comes open? What what do you go through psychologically? Uh, that's been a bit brutal, you know, because it, especially this year being our 40th an with the Hooters, we have a 40th anniversary tour we were about to um, embark on. Or, you know, I mean, they're really, and, and in our case, because a lot of it is in Europe, we haven't gotten cancellations as of yet. You know, everything's on a hold. And, you know, I'm sure within the next few weeks we'll start hearing something and um, and that's all about the governments and things like that, you know. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons I'm paying attention to everything as well. Um, but, you know, I mean, look, and, and you said, you know, playing at home is one thing, but playing on a stage is another. I know I have a different gear, maybe a few different gears that, you know, my mind and my body goes through when I play a live show compared to what I do at home. And, you know, this has been, you know, I'm trying to find a silver lining in all this because... I figure if I have a little bit of time, I'm going to learn something. You know, I'm I'm reading a lot of uh, I'm reading a lot of books, and um, um, I'm I'm playing. Um, you know, I'm trying to learn some new things, new instruments. I'm messing around with my studio at home, doing some things. And when I say studio, I just like anybody else to have a little, you know, uh, universal audio set up. And I got a laptop, and I got some speakers, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> You know, learn something new, take advantage of the time, I guess, you know, but uh, because I think that it would probably make me a little crazy thinking that, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, if, if this is all I had to do every day, and which would actually be, wouldn't be so bad because at least I have, you know, I could go to my refrigerator and there's food. I feel terrible for these families and, 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 and that are in these situations of like, you know, how do I put uh, 
food on the table for my my family or my kids. I mean, I, that, that's a that's a rough deal right there. So um, you know, my, my problems are pretty minute, but you know, they're still my problems. And uh, um, you know, I, I I'm just trying to make the most of it, like you see. Well, you know, it's funny you said how you feel bad for those families. And it's and, you know, I had, I had the same thought because especially, you know, because I lived in L.A. for so long and there's people struggling all the time. And, you know, I'm luckily in a point in my life now where I'm not living paycheck to paycheck. But I have been right. at the point where I lived pay, pay, paycheck to paycheck. And it's one of the scariest sure. feelings because you wake up and now I can see families just waking up going, holy crap, you know, where is that stimulus check? Where is that? And it is scary. And it's yeah. one of the things that through this whole stay at home thing. It makes you not take things for granted. And I think like what you just said, yeah. you, know, you have food in the refrigerator. And I think that's the one thing. I think we're all going to come out stronger people when this is all over. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, you know, look, this is certainly going to change um, a lot of us um, in, in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, I, I watched something last night where they said that, you know, social distancing could be something that we could be look, dealing with to you know, 2022, you know, and, you know, think about that, you know, here we are in 2020. So that's, that's a long time. And until they find a vaccination, I think that, you know, people going, you know, uh, as far as entertainment, going to shows and standing next to one another and celebrating with each other with like they would be used to, that's, that's certainly going to change. So, uh, um, you know, and, and a lot of things, I, I don't even think that we really even, can foresee how much it's going to change things. Uh, you, one thing you really hope for is that, you know, because we were so ill-prepared here in the U.S., um, and I don't want to get into politics and stuff like that because we could we could go nuts here, but the fact is that we were we were unprepared, and there's been people that have been warning us, you know, for, for some time now that this could be our foe and enemy, and we, you know, we had, we were like, caught with our pants down and now you know i've heard it said that you know in the u.s we're like a third world country and 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 and, and that's that's a shame man we shouldn't be in that position indeed you know and uh, so you would hope that somehow um you know um whoever's going to be um our next president will be um uh taking care of biz in the right way you know exactly. because um there's a lot of finger pointing going on right now and I'm probably doing it right now, too. But the thing of it is, you know, I woke up this morning and the guy wanted to fire an organization right in the middle of a pandemic. And you've got to be kidding. The World Health Organization, I didn't see that. But the guy wanted to, you know, he's, he's withholding funding to these people. And it's like, are you kidding me? This is the wrong time to be doing that. But, you know, he, he wants to point fingers. And it's terrible. To it, me, it's absolutely terrible. It so is. that's like just thinking of himself. So, it, it, you know. <laughs> it is. It Don't is. Get me started. Oh no! It, you know it's crazy out there, and that's one thing is uh, that one thing that can that keeps us together is music. You know, and that's one of the reasons why you yeah. know I've been going between actors and musicians lately because you know I've been getting yeah. past guests. But now for you, I got to ask this, and I asked our, our good friend Rich Redman, and I forget what he said. Yeah. But, but how many drum sets do you have? He told me how many he had, and I was like, holy crap! Like, where do you storm? How many gear? Because I see you posting them on Facebook all the time, different sets. How many sets do you have? I, I probably, I think there's, like, if I put them all together, like, that were technically mine, I think I got 12. Now, now I could go and, you know, I mean, I got drums that I that are, uh, tr you know, like that um, Cartage Companies, um, you know, one in particular keeps for me for when I, when I go to uh, Europe, um, that has exactly the specs that I use and things like that. But here I have, um, yeah, my garage. In my home, I have these shelves that's kind of like, you know, um, uh, you know, there's these cartridge companies, John Paradise and stuff like that. I always model, I try to make my garage look like that. I pull all my bass drums and my snare drums and my toms and my hardware. And I got hardware in cases and things like that. And I probably have things that I don't even know. Like if I went through an inventory, I probably have uh, drums that I'm not even aware of. But, um, um, and which is good and bad because there's a drum I'm trying to find right now that I'm hoping is at a studio I left there that is really near and dear to me. <laughs> so, and I've had it since 1980, and I use it on two tracks that are Hooters tracks that were really cool. So uh, I'm hoping to find it somewhere. What two but tracks? Nancy, probably around 12. Around what? 12. Where's Rich? You got about 100 kids? Is he I, 100? He said something, and I, I was like, dude, I don't, I, 
he, I, I couldn't believe it. I said to him, because my wife's like, he probably only has like three drum sets. I'm like, oh, no. So I text him and he says, it was some outrageous, outrageous thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> what, yeah. Were, what were yeah. the two tracks? What, yeah. were the, what, were the, what were the two well, tracks? I, 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 it's, a, it's a funny thing to think about because, look, you know, when I, um, I've been playing Zildjian cymbals since 1980s. When I played Live Aid, uh, I think after Live Aid, I was, um, I, was um, I met the guy that was the artist relations person there, and he uh, asked me if I was interested in playing Zildjian because at the time I was playing Zildjian, I had some other brands that I was using just because that's what I could afford and what I preferred. And um, and I remember at that time it was a different day, a different era, and you know because we're I'm old. <laughs> what it was like playing Live Aid because we know it's so funny you know people a whole generation of kids don't know about it because it's not like you don't see DVDs like check out Live Aid and hopefully when the, the, the movie about Freddie Mercury was on in the finale they're at Live Aid and that may have brought some more attention to it but for us sure. who are from especially growing I was down the Jersey Shore I couldn't get up to make it but it was on TV yeah. it was such it was bigger than life what was that first of all how did you right. guys get the gig and what was it like playing the gig yeah, well, it was, we were at the height of, well, we were about embarking on the height of our popularity. You know, we were, you know, we made a record, Nervous Night, which was, you know, it, it was a very successful album. And we were just starting a tour with that record. And we met Bill Graham, and our manager, uh, and Larry Maggot, who was um, um, running Electric Factory Concerts, was a uh, very much involved with uh, you know concerts around the United States, but especially concerts in Philadelphia, JFK Stadium. Um, he started um, you know electric factory concerts with uh, with uh, with the Speedbacks, you know, and it was um, and uh, uh, this guy really championed us to be a part of that show, and I think you know he had to sell us to um, Bob Geldof because if you recall. Geldof, there's a Rolling Stone article when Geldof was looking at the lineup for Philly, he saw the Hooters and he said, who the fuck are the Hooters, you know? <laughs> and uh, that, that was his line. And um, But we pulled that off uh, really well. Uh, we, did, we, you know, it, we were a new band and we got to play. And really, my, if you see, um, you know, when you see the, uh, the movie, um, the Queen movie, recently you see Freddie Mercury, when he walks out and looks at that audience, that's what I saw. I mean, I walked out, that's exactly, the, when I see the film, it was the experience that I had. And, and for me, you know, like, you know, I grew up in Levittown, outside of Philadelphia, and I remember walking on stage, and Jack Nicholson shook my hand as I'm going up to play the drums, and all these, you know, it was back there, Chubby Chase was there, Jack Nicholson shook my hand, it was just such a massive event. Anybody that was, anybody that was doing anything at the time was there, so I was hobnobbing with, like, you know, uh, uh, Ron Wood, Keith Richards, uh, uh, you know, they were all there. Man, we were all just hanging out backstage. It was incredible. It was incredible for me. Well, it, it was such a big crowd, and you know, and I think that's yeah. uh, that's uh, can be nerve wracking. But did you guys feel a little better because you know you sort of had a home field advantage? You know what I'm saying? It's like you're yeah. you're Philadelphia, you're Philadelphia, the pride of Philly at that time. You, you know, you had the home field advantage. Did that make it easier going on stage? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not really sure. I think each one of us had a different uh, uh, feeling about it because we're all, um, you know, uh, I, you know. I wasn't. Um, I, 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 I just can't remember. You know, I remember thinking. You know, I, I, I guess I felt like you know I was just I was so damn happy to be part of this thing, and it was mind blowing. But um, fear wasn't really a part of the equation. You know, I remember looking out and thinking. Hey, it's just a 
few songs you were going to do. I didn't know at the time. I knew it was a big deal, but I didn't know it was going to turn into what it turned into. You know, later on, you see Phil Collins. Phil Collins played with Led Zeppelin that day, and they didn't have the greatest, from what I'd say, the greatest performance. Um, uh, Tony Thompson was, they had two drummers, they didn't have the greatest performance, but you knew it was something special because, you know, here was this guy playing a show in London and getting on the Concord and flying to America to play another show. And, it, you know, there, there, there was a big deal. But, you know, it was a different day because now information flies around so quickly. And, um, you know, with phones and, and, and so it was like the, the print media and, and, and maybe the news media on TV you would find out. Now, I think it, it was a sat. If you recall, it was a satellite event and it ran on TV 24-7. Um, all over the place. So, um, and, and, um, so it was, um, it, 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 the enormity of it didn't really strike me till after the fact, but I knew I was doing something really, really special. Um, you know, and I, at the time, because of what, what it was in our, uh, uh, you know, in our careers with the Hooters, it, it, it's, it was, um, we were, I felt like I was on a bit of a rocket ship anyway, because, you know, I was about, getting on a tour bus then and I was opening shows, you know, the band was opening shows with Don Henley and Squeeze and, and, uh, Lover Boy. And we were, they were, these were big bands, you know, I remember, uh, um, you know, we toured with Brian Adams and, uh, we just did some incredible things that we just kept on getting better and better and better. And, um, those are like late, I was like from 85 to 89 were just, you know, every day you woke up to some, you know, you woke up to good news, <laughs> you know. Now, what do you think bridged you from, you know, Amore was very popular in the Philadelphia area. Uh, that was yeah. uh, that was the original thing. How do you think you bridged the popularity from that, and you were so huge in this area, to being national yeah. with your next album? What was it? Was it a sound people were waiting for? Did you get some good breaks? Was it because you're all good looking guys in MTV? All that factor. What yeah. do you think? What do you think gave you that break that pushed you over the hump? Because so many bands get stuck at that hump and they never climb yeah. over it. Yeah, I, I think there were a lot of. Um, well, first of all, you know, I really think that you know we had everything, the stars lined up, as they would say, um, and, and, and 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 everything. Timing is, is, is has a lot to do with it. You know, Rob and uh, Rob uh, wrote time after time. Eric and Rob both had a lot to do with Cindy Lauper's record. She's so unusual. It was recorded in 1982, and that um, you know the Hooters were already playing together. But we took a, you know we didn't necessarily split up, but we took a break. And those guys were, were you know heavily involved in that record. Rob co-writing time after time with Cindy. And then the band formed, and we were signed to Columbia Records with Rick Jurdoff, the same producer who produced Cindy Lauper's record. And that basically, you know, the record label, look, the record label obviously was paying attention to us because they, you know, we were selling a lot of records, which, which she's so unusual. So, and, and we just happened to, um, uh, with Nervous Night, um, you know, we didn't, I don't think it was like those guys were out to write hit songs. They just wrote a couple of songs that were just people, you know, it worked for radio at the time. And, and even reporting the way they report when radios get, when songs get played on radio are different than they are today. Because we didn't have, I don't think you had a UPC code or that kind of stuff. So it took time to see if you really had a hit record. But we worked constantly, man. We were constantly on the road. Now, and then you've got to think about like MTV happening. And, you know, maybe there was a like, um, you know, that might have hurt us and helped us, too. You know, I mean, I don't know. We looked the way we looked, but, you know, I look back sometimes and I'm going, oh, man, I wore what? And I did that to my hair, you know, I mean, whatever. You know, but, um, um, you know, we caught a wave like you got to do. But I'll tell you what, those guys, um, it's no fluke. They're great songwriters. Eric and Zane and Rob Hyman are great songwriters. And... And, um, you know, you're about as good as your material. And everybody in the band can play. And everybody plays together well. You know, I mean, it wasn't like you had, like, one... Uh, we, we just play as a band very well. Like, you know, like you too. They play great together, you know. Um, uh, 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 the police, they play great together. The Hooters, they all, we play great as a band. So we kind of... Um, I just... Uh, you know, we, we caught a wave, and um, look, man, you know, that was, you can go the other way, too. Look, we're fortunate, and, and I'll tell you what happened when, 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 when I don't ever want to say that, you know, uh, America turned her back on, on the leaders. That didn't happen, but, but we did. 
did, you know, music goes through phases and trends and styles. And, you know, when, when our time was up here in, in the late 80s, um, we, we fortunately had a major success with our, our records and songs in Europe. So, especially Germany, and Germany really embraced uh, the Hooter song records that didn't necessarily, uh, interestingly enough, Nervous Night kind of made a little bit of noise over there, but the following record, One Way Home, was a huge album over there, and Johnny B from, um, from uh, uh, One Way Home was massive, so we went to Europe, Germany, and we played, and um, had, had, had major success till to this day, you know, we go over there and I think that's what's so disappointing about not going over for, well, I don't know if that's going to happen. This, who knows what's going to happen. But, you know, uh, if we don't, it'll be disappointing. And hopefully, you know, there'll be, uh, uh, you know, if you've got to postpone something, you reschedule it. But, you know, they're talking some pretty long, long periods of time here. So who knows? But, yeah, that was a long-winded answer, Stephen. I apologize. Oh, no. Basically, there are a lot of, a lot of factors in why you know, things happen for us. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really happy they did, you know, because it's given me a whole, um, it's given me a kind of platform to do the things that I do here in Philly now, as you mentioned, in the pocket. And, you know, the Hooter success helped me build on in the pocket because I, you know, I had a little bit of street cred with the musician that I, that I asked to join me in, in the pocket where I record Philly songs. And um, so, you know, that's how that goes. Now, within the pocket, you know, it's, it is a great project. And people, if you don't know, in the pocket, I, I call it like a Philly super group. When you go to a concert, you know, everyone shows up. They do songs. It's a great show. And um, for, yeah. for, for in the pocket, you know, growing up, were you a, a real big listener of the Philadelphia sound? Or is it something you grew yeah. into? Yeah, I, no, I was. I was a radio. I listened to... Because well, I'm, you know, I'm 64, man. I listen to WIL and I listen to Wibbage. I listen to AM radio. I remember when the Nas, when Nas got on radio, and I didn't know it. I just assumed Nas were huge all over the world, you know. And I remember the American Dream with Nick Jameson's band and Winkle and uh, all those guys, you know, like that. That didn't get a lot of airplay, but you know, I I knew about them and I knew about Philly International, you know, when that everybody's. these these cool records were coming out of our city, but I just, assumed, I just assumed that was happening everywhere, you know? So, um, um, yeah, I was pretty, um, in tune to, to music and look in Philly, what, what we are Philly international is, is, is and it, it really gets, gets touted as the, you know, the thing out of Philly, but you know, for 50 years, over 50 years, and I got to say this, you know, a guy that was heavily involved with the Philadelphia Folk Festival was a guy named Gene Shea, who just passed away last night. Uh, and, and, and Gene was, he would host the Philadelphia Folk Festival. And it's a massive uh, 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 event out in Shanksville, PA, outside of Philadelphia, that brought the best folk artists of the world to this show. And we were all in Philly introduced to this music, and there were DJs that would play this music that really wouldn't play it in, in a, a lot of places in America. But you know, we got to hear it all the time here in Philly through guys like Gene Shea and David Dye and, and Ed Shockey. But you know, it, 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 it's actually a sad day in Philly because of the loss of Gene Shea. Now, what was some of the other bands you listened to when you were younger? I listened, well, you know, like anything else, I was really into British, this stuff that came over from the UK. You know, I love the Rolling Stones. I love the Kinks. I love the Stones. I love the Dave Clark Five. I mean, I love that stuff coming up as a kid. And then anything else, you know, like I was really into punk rock. I liked punk music. I liked that old scene. I could always remember my, you know, look, <laughs> I'm a little crazy, man. I'm always like trying to, like I see my you know, like some of my favorite drummers, and I, I, I'm always trying to pay attention to what they're doing. And one of the greats is Steve Gadd, great, great drummer. You know, like I'm home and I'm going, how does he do this thing? And I, I work on it, you know, and I got to remember, like, I'm not 18 anymore. <laughs> now, neither is Steve, but, you know, I'm going back and like, going back and trying to, you know, Bonzo did this when, you know, like, you know, picking up on stuff. So I'm always listening to stuff and, and, 
and trying to learn and get better. But these are, you know, drummers and artists and songs that I would listen to. Um, you know, my favorite, like, I just, I like that. I like the early, you know, I always liked Pink Floyd, but, you know, the early days of Pink Floyd, and I was a, just a massive fan of David Bowie's. And uh, so, you know, that was it, you know, for me. I mean, I listened to a lot of different music. And then over the years, you know, when I started, you know, getting deep into, um, you know, um, you know, studying whatever I could study, I, 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 I listened to uh, my fair share of jazz, too, you know, so, um, but those are the kind of things that influenced me, you know, I try to try to be uh, open minded about music, you know, because I think it's really important. And I was fortunate enough to play on because the hip hop thing uh, uh, was such a heavy thing out of Philly as well that. You know, I, I, I get called to play drums on um, on records that were um, being produced out of Studio 4, and they would, like, loop the drum beats. So I did a bunch of stuff. You know, early on, uh, the guy that uh, I worked with, uh, Joe Niccolo, me and Andy Kravitz, a great drummer who lives on the West Coast, would, would, would do some session stuff. Andy did a lot of it, but I did some of it as well. So, you know, um, I got hip to hip-hop when I didn't even know what hip-hop was, you know. Now, how did you bring In The Pocket together? Where did you get the idea from? And then what was the steps to get this group together? Because it's such a big thing, because you all have different schedules, yeah. and to embark something, and to pick the songs. I mean, yeah. how did the whole project start? Well, um, it really started when I moved back. I lived in the West Coast like you. I lived out there, and I moved back here 10 years ago. Um, I, I moved back, and um, I... I you know, like I loved living on the West Coast, but I, you know, like unfortunately, some people, you know, I went through a divorce. I, I decided, you know, I, I would go home, kind of recircle my wagons, so so to speak. And um, you know, I I I, I end up falling in love with my my wife of today, Dallin. And Dallin and I were taking a walk in Rittenhouse Square, and we were just talking, like we always do, about music or whatever, and. Uh, it, you know, I just, we just started talking about how cool it would be to do a project, um, you know, where we were honoring, I guess that's a word, you know, we honoring music of Philadelphia. And, and at the time, you know, I, 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 I happened to work for this technology company for a little while called mp3.com. And I was managing music and, um, you know, they, I, I wrote, there was a this little, little thing we called an easy, uh, an e-zine and I would, I would manage pop and rock music there. And, and I had, and I would call, when I would pick these songs, I'd call the essential songs of rock or the essential songs of pop. So when it was like the tagline that we used when we started, um, in the pocket, um, so in the pocket was initially, you know, David Austin in the pocket. And then I would pick these songs arbitrarily. I, you know, I would just pick songs that like moved me as, someone you know inspiring a musician a young musician and and then i would uh, grab musicians that i wanted to play with such as you know the, you know the, i love the a's the philadelphia band richard bush and rick defonzo and mikey snyder they were great bands so i asked a couple of those guys to play with me there was a band called peru you that i i, I they're friends of mine from the band i always wanted to play with them so i asked greg to play and so i just used different eric and rob they both helped me um you know this guy bill whitman who was cindy lopper's music director he came in he engineered he played bass on stuff so anybody that i can get that like i admired and uh and 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 done stuff in philadelphia um you know i've had him p participate uh in the project you know so it, it's been um it's been fun it's almost like this this fall it'll be 10 years and uh you know we'll record a song and we'll do a little if someone's interested they can check it out at songsinthepocket.org if you go to that website, you can see a little video for each song. I mean, we recorded Punk Rock Girl by the Dead Milk, by the Dead Milkmen. You know, I had Pete Donnelly and, uh, from uh, NRBQ and the Figs on that. And um, um, uh, Bill Whitman, Tommy Conwell, the great Tommy Conwell. He played guitar and played on it. Richard Bush sang that one. And there's like uh, Disco Inferno, which had did T.J. Tyndall, who, rest in peace, is no longer with us. He was... He was on that one, and uh, he was the music, the actually the, the initial music director on the on the first one um, by um, uh, by the Tramps, and he played on our version as well. So uh, 
yeah, it's, it's been a fun, it's a lot of work, um, but that's been a fun and I'd say a pretty successful project. Now, I, I saw you guys, I've seen you guys live. Uh, I, it was it was a great show. It was at the uh, Keswick, I believe. Thank you. And now, oh, how, you were that right. How how do you how do you set the whole thing up? Because you know you have to get these musicians. You're you're, you're playing these different songs. Yeah. You're shuffling. You're the only one who's like stationary because other people are shuffling in yeah. and out. But you're at the drums. How yeah. do you prepare for that? What's is is it a long practice session or do these guys just no. know these songs? No, no we don't practice. We, 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 man, it. it don't, we've gotten together a couple times to maybe run a tune, but we never rehearse the show. We get we have a set. They're all pro guys, you know. There's a set list, and they know what they have to have together. It's like we're doing a session. Somebody will write a chart. They know what he has to do, and you know, even sometimes the lineup for who's playing on songs. Sometimes these guys haven't even played together, and we go up on stage and we we play. I mean, that night at the Keswick, I, there there were guys playing on stage that never played together. Uh, which was super cool, you know. I mean, that was, I, I think uh, we, we did the we did the streets of Philadelphia that night with Andy King, who was in the Hooters, and Don Wing, Van Winkle played guitar. They never played together, so it was it was a super cool. It's a cool experience. I mean, it, it, it really is a little, um, you know. I've been lucky where it hasn't been a disaster ever, but somehow we always should pull it off. Now. Tell me about the bar band. I see your post on Facebook, and the thing that stinks yeah. is you're always playing out like, I don't like to go over the bridge. You know, if I, I'll go in the center city, I'll take the speed line in. But being a Jersey guy, I don't like going over the bridge. You guys yeah. are always playing out there. What's yeah? I know. How do you know Kenny Aronson? I know Kenny's involved with it. Yeah, Kenny. Well, Kenny Aronson, he's a legendary bass player. I mean, you know, I mean, guys played with Derringer and, and Bob Dylan. He's done incredible work. He's my neighbor. He doesn't live very. And my dad, it was bir his birthday yesterday, Kenny. I think he turned forty-five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kidding, but uh, he, he, you know, his guy's done uh, has an, an amazing career, played bass, a great, great guy. Um, so he, he, you know, when he moved into town, I um, because I knew him, um, uh, you know, he, he doesn't remember this, but I first met him in Finland, and and uh, we played a festival together. Hooters played with Bob Dylan. And um, he was him and Chris Barker and G. Smith were in Bob's band, Bob Dylan's band, and um, so I, I, I met him briefly. And then when he moved into town, actually he plays with John Eddy as well. So I know John, and um, so you know when he moved into town, I just asked him to, you know, I think we played a few sessions together, and then we um, with the bar band. The bar band was just something. Um, because, you know, one thing, you know, in the pocket, there's there's over 30 of us sometimes. It's kind of hard to put a gig together and do a gig. So um, I, I wanted to go play, to stay in shape uh, and go make a few bucks, go play a couple bars. I mean, some, you know, we, we could do, we just to, to do something, like a pickup basketball game. You know, I put this band together with Steve Butler and Greg Davis and Wally Smith and Kenny Aronson and myself. And it's just a little, you know, it's a barnacle on the ship of In the Pocket that we broke off to, you know, to do some local gigs. So we played down Atlantic City at the Hard Rock Cafe, which was the last gig that I played before all this went down, which is so bizarre. You know, it was uh, the 12th, I think it was the 12th of, was it 12th of March? Right, that was the last thing that I did, and, you know, I've been in the house since. So, uh, 12, no, the 13th of March. So um, I can't wait to get back to it, you know, because I really miss those guys. I miss the connection, and um, you know, you know how it is. You just miss what you're doing daily. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, it's just you know you you think wow March already, and it just you're right. Every day runs together, and uh, yeah. it is crazy because you know. I have tick I have tickets to concerts this summer that I'm not going to go, yeah. and, and it's just it's a it's a changing time. Now I got to talk to you because about the Philly songs. I'm in the Philly area. When the Hooters yeah. were when the Hooters were breaking, you know, when you were getting your chops, what was the Philadelphia music scene like? Where were the bars? Who was around? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, well. There were a lot more bars to play. I mean, when we're, we're like for us, it was you know our bar period was really from 1980 to 1985, where we were playing a lot of bars, and
and we were playing a lot of high school. We played a lot of high school concerts, and we played a lot of, um, you know, there were venues down Atlantic City. I remember those places called Blondies we would play. And then we would get in the van. Like, I just thought up either down South Street, there was Grendel's Lair, which was on Fifth and South, and we used to play there every Monday night. And then there was a place on, called Ripley's, which is on Sixth and South, and we used to play. And people would always say they saw us play Dobbs. We never played Dobbs. <laughs> we just never played there. I, I, and people say, oh, yeah, I saw you Dobbs. We never played there. Uh, it's just, we just didn't, you know. I mean, I played there with Joey Wilson and, and Winkle, but I never, we never played there as a band. Um, um, so, and there was a cool place called the London Victory Club where, like, Robert Hazard, the Heroes would play. The A's would play, John Eddy would play, the Hooters would play. Um, there was a place in the northeast, northeast Philly called the Empire Rock Room, which later became into more of like a hair metal joint. And before it was like, you know, you know Cinderella would, used to play there, and um, Mike Lacomp's band would play there. Um, uh, um, he's, a, he's from that area. And um, um, Tangiers, I think that was the name of his band. A lot of these bands I would forget, you know, that the name of the bands. But now it's coming back because the great thing about social media, you know, people pull up pictures and 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 you get these, uh, uh, you know, m- memories of these old of these days, like or really just old times now. Um, but there, and then you know, for us, you know, we realized that break out, we had to get in a van and we traveled around. You know, go to Boston, play the Paradise in Harrisburg. We played the Metron. I think it was called the Metro or Metron in Harrisburg. And we used to play a lot in Allentown and Reading. And go down to D.C. and play at the Bayou at Desperados. And then in Baltimore, we played a place called Hammerjacks. Uh, there was another place that I forget that I really loved. And um, they, were the, they, were the, they were the best of times, you know. And then, you know, one day you get a deal and you make a record and they tell you you're going on tour with Don Henley. And you're playing in theaters and you're learning a whole new way of doing it, you know. So... You know, for us, it was things were jumping off, and um, and and it was always you know the the next step, the next best thing, and uh, we had a ball. Now you've been doing it for a long time. It's been your career. What made you start yeah. playing the drums? I mean, what what made you become a drummer? Um. Yeah, I guess. Well, I, I by default, honestly, with me because I really wanted to play the guitar. And, um, but I could play drums, I could play a beat, I had rhythm. And uh, the kid in my neighborhood, Wayne Myers, he played guitar, and I played, played a snare drum. So we had a band when we were, I was 11 years old. You know, we would put records on like a lot of kids would do, and we'd listen to James Brown live at the Apollo, and we'd listen to, um, uh, um, you know, Beatles records, and we would try to, I mean, we, we we would try to play what we could play. Like I, he could play the riff to what I say. I remember we played that a lot by uh, uh, Ray Charles. So we played that, like, which is an unusual choice for a couple of 11 year olds, <laughs> but we could play that. Da, 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 da. Maybe what I say, we could play that. And then we would make up stuff. And we, I remember we learned, we played Wipeout, which I was like featured on Wipeout by the Adventures. Da, 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 and I played that. And, um, um, but yeah, you know, drums. And then, you know, my dad, took me to see Buddy Rich and Duke Ellington and I, I actually took a photo with Buddy when I was 11 years old and I was like just enamored by you know the way he played and I, you know, I took lessons and then I, I, I you know I, I, I was good enough to get in bands and bands was a way of not getting your ass kicked when I grew up <laughs> when I was a kid you know so it was like okay you know, I played in the band, and so my, everybody came up to see your band play, my high school band. And um, so, you know, and one thing led to another, and I was just always just good enough to, to get in the band. And then meeting Rob and Eric was just a, a real uh, a bit of good fortune for me because they were just so super talented guys. Now, you guys were big in Philly, then you became big national. How does that affect? Yeah. How does it affect someone's life? I mean, because you go, it's one thing to be a local celebrity, but then when all of a sudden you yeah. get national attention, how does one keep their mind together? How do you how do you keep in check without getting an ego? Because it has to feed you because people are adoring you. Yeah, I mean, you know, you gotta you gotta have a little bit of 
um, you know, look, I, my parents were really super cool. And, 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 you know, but look, you know, like any family, we had our issues. You know, like, I'm, you know, I've never made any secret. You know, I had some issues. I, I had a drug addiction that I, that I, I you know, overcame um, through the help of a lot of people. It wasn't like one day I just said, you know, I'm stopping. Some people do that. Um, you know, I had to go to, you know, AA and NA and do all that stuff, and I had to get therapy and did that. And I know glossing over it, you know, is one thing, but, you know, it nearly killed me. And then I, I you know, um, I think where I really made a significant change in my life was like in 1986. Now, I had some bumps in the road since, but 86 is when I made the big, big, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting loose of anything that's going to kill me. Um, I went away for three months and then, you know, but, um, but that really helped me ground me because I'll tell you, you know, who helped me a big deal. I'll tell you, Grace Slick, she called me up one day, um, uh, because she, her husband, uh, Skip Johnson's a buddy. And, um, and she, he, he asked her, listen, when you call Dave and talk some sense into him and she called me up and she, she gave me the best advice. And when I was getting so sober back then, she so she said, um, "Go to the steel workers meeting," which was, you know, the steel workers union. Right. He said, "Go to that meeting. They won't they won't give a shit what you do, who you are, and they will straighten your ass out." And um, so I did. I took her up on that. I went to that union on Seventeenth and JFK uh, every Monday night. You know, when I was back out of out of treatment, and and that helped me. And, um, you know, uh, that, you know, like other people, when they see you kind of not, you know, in your usual space and not in a good head, they'll pull your covers in that group. <laughs> so um, that was real helpful. And and then, look, man, you know, it, 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 life, you know, the, the Hooters have been at it for 40 years. So we've had ups and downs, life stuff, divorce stuff. And if you want to, you know, life is um, health things I mean, you've been through health things we've been through it anytime you go through something that's going to trust your 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 way of living every day it humbles you you know and um you know you realize that you know life you know you, I, I just don't want to take anything for granted like like this you know it's easy for me to complain about everything and possibly not going on the road and not going to tour but i gotta look at the fact that i've got a roof under my head i'm gonna be able to stay in my house i got a great wife a you know all that stuff i gotta be grateful for it it's just sometimes i gotta remind my head steve some days i gotta remind myself dude get a grip <laughs> that's what i gotta do exactly get a grip. yeah i mean it, it is crazy we, we all have to do that and you're right when i went through health problems it opens up your eyes a lot um, now, yeah. I was going to ask you. You're, you're also now you're doing a, a podcast with Andy Weinberg. Tell me a little yeah. about. Tell me a little about the podcast. Yeah. Uh, well, I, so I was a I was a fan of Mark Marin. Um, not that going to put our podcast on a level like that, but I I, I, I was a fan of it. I watching it. He did a TV show that was based on his podcast, and then Andy Weinberg was a a, a guy that I read his. You know his his um, columns when he was like he worked at I think you know he was based out of, of the Courier Times, but then he wrote for a bunch of different other newspapers. When he was let go, like they let go of some great journalists uh, writers, um, he called me up one day and said, "How would you like to do a podcast?" And I was saying, uh, "Well, I think he called and said, what do you know about podcasts?'" I said, "Well, I like listening to Mark Maron's podcast." I think I listen to you too. You know, I think you've been doing this a long time. So I was like, yeah, I like, you know, I like, I like listening to guys, you know, I like the, the, the format. Um, so, um, he said, you know, would you think of the weeks later we embarked on, and he said, do you mind branding it? You know, David Austin into the pocket podcast. I said, oh, sure. Why not? So it, that's how we went about it. I mean, it really wasn't any kind of, um, you know, big deal. I mean, we got a couple people that, help us do the podcast every week and keep keep it growing but i can't wait to get back to it because that always motivates me it always helps me realize because i get a guest on that is that that makes me think of something that i didn't think about i don't know about you you know does that work like that with you when you have think you hear something go ah you know that's well, that's what happens to me i get a little bit of insight into something that i was thinking about that day no, it never fails, man. Well, for me, for me, what happens is 
Well, it's different for you because a lot of the people you've been on, you have a personal relationship with. You know them. So right. you have history. Uh, for me, I mean, I've done over almost 800 episodes. You know, I don't I don't wow. know a lot of these people. You know, they're people that I wow. admire their work. So for me, right. I do get sparked because I don't I don't write anything out. I just I just do it. I, I like have, that. I don't have because it's, it's I like that. It gets boring if you do that. But so me, yeah. if I sit there and it's the best thing is, you know, with act because with actors and musicians and TV writers, what's great is. You guys all have stories, and, and it's one of those things that you know you've been on stage or you've done this. You know how to roll with it. You know, so if you sit there and get a question out of left field, you know how to deal with it. i got to ask you, did, did you ever have, like, I'm not asking you to name names, but with, when you were in that situation, um, do you, did, have you had anybody that, like, oh, my God, I wish I never asked him or her? Is that, is, did, does that ever happen with you? It happened. Or did, have you, have you, it happened once. Yeah. It happened once, and it was. It wasn't like okay. If I if I record on the phone, you know, and if I'm not if yeah. I'm not digging a, a conversation, I can just cut it. You know, it's not like right. you know. But I had a guest in studio, and I'm not going to mention her name. And she was the yeah. nicest, nicest person, but she was just boring, and she didn't really want to talk. And I and I kept looking at because I, <laughs> I, I recorded in a studio in Burbank, and I had to do an hour. And I kept looking at the right. at the timer, and I'm like, "Holy shit! It's only 22 minutes." And then, <laughs> but then at the oh. end, and then she started vaping in the studio, and I'm like, "What?" You know. But she was so nice, and uh, but oh, she was just man. boring. And and you sit there, and she's like, uh, "Oh, that was so good." And her PR person's like, "She really liked you," and I'm like, "Yeah, I had so much to talk to her about, but she didn't want to share." Uh, and that's the thing. But yeah, uh, so, yeah, and, yeah. You, you, you gotta be. I mean, if you gotta jump in, you gotta be able to. I mean, I don't, I, you know, look, I have no trouble talking. I mean, I don't know what I'm saying half the time, but I'm like, I don't mind. I like having, I like people and I like having a conversation. And, um, I think that if you're going to get into this, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta say something, right? <laughs> I don't get that. Oh, yeah, true. Now I, I got I got another question about the Hooters. Um, why do you think you yeah, guys have such a sure. uh, international such international uh, success? I mean, it's success here, but you guys are huge. Like you said, you play festivals in Germany. What do you think? Yeah. What do you think got them? What What do you think made them just really love you guys? I I, I think uh, well, look, man. You know, if you go see the if you haven't seen the Hooters and if you have an opportunity, even to the day, like I think we just. We just recorded a, uh, there's a DVD, um, a DVD, or a, a li- hopefully this will be live stream, a, a stream video that people can see from, we did a show called Rock of Ages in 2018 that is shortly, I think it's going to come out soon, it'll be available, and you can see what we're all about. It, it's a really high energy show, and um, I think they appreciate that, they appreciate the work that we seem to do, that we do on stage. They, they dig it. And they know that there's like every night you come see the Hooters, there's some, there's some signature things that we'll do, but then every night you never know what's going to happen. Um, so there is a, a, a performance level that we expect of one another and the band, if you like, just comes out and, and does it. But they've been in Europe, uh, embraced the band like, uh, I, I, it's hard to hard to fathom, you know. But it's been, I'm so grateful that they do because, um, you know, it, it really when when because it, you know, I, I, you know, you mentioned that I'm a big sports junkie, you know, and I like, I like, I love them all. Football, I just I, I go nuts so. But you know, think about a football player. Really, the average football player has a career of maybe four years, right? Right. You know what I mean? Like, guy, me if you're lucky. In America, you know, unless you're, you know, there's a lot of bands that you can look back. If you really go back and look at, you know, you have success in just a few years. And then, you know, you make some music and you go and producing and you do some things. And you kind of you realize that it's really kind of a, a jumping off point. You know, it's going to stay in the business. You either produce or, or you work with other artists and things like that, which, you know, I, I'm always trying to do. But, um, you know, uh, Europe has been something that has been great for us because we go over there and keep on cracking away at you know what what we do and uh it uh, it always like you know whatever we're doing separately when we all go back together as a band for those two months what we're doing it's always like we're back to the we're back to square one again as a band it's pretty cool 
Well, I I saw you guys the last two years. Like my friend Paul Guerrero from college bought tickets to see um, the Hooters at the Keswick the last two years. Ah, uh, cool. Now, <laughs> you guys, you know, you're you're not young guys, but you just put no. on. No, but you put on. You put on like a two and a half hour. Two hour forty five minute show, and you just you honestly yeah. you just crush it for the whole time. How do you keep yeah. that energy? Like, because that's I mean, I get up, I I'll do some stuff, I'll take a walk to get rid of the recycling down because I live in a condo complex, and I come back and I'm tired. Right. I mean, how do you guys do it? Because yeah. I mean, and you're up there, and I always say the drummer yeah. always works the hardest because yeah. you know you'll see yeah. you'll see Rob not playing some songs, you'll see Eric, and then you have all the different guitarists. Yeah. But you guys, you have to be there right. just kicking ass. How do you keep that stamina up? Yeah, well, I do. You know, I I'm conscious about my. I mean, literally, I do, I condition to go on the road. I mean, that's what kind of, you know, I was thinking, I worked really hard for this summer, and and, and maybe it, it won't be a summer, so I got to remember myself mentally that, you know, I can't, you know, I like watching movies, I like eating potato chips, I like doing, like, normal, I like a hamburger, you know, I like food. You love pizza. <laughs> so I got to really force, I got to force myself out there to walk, like, I'll go walk you know, you know, there's a little walk around my neighborhood. It's about three miles and there's some hills. So I'll do that. I'll go do that. When, you know, when I get off the phone with you, I'll go walk. I'll do my walk. Um, so it's what keeps me uh, in shape. And then when, when things open, I'm, I'm a swimmer. I swim. And, you know, when I was younger, I was pretty fit. I was a gymnast, pretty good gymnast. And, uh, you know, and it runs in my family. I got an uncle with it. Olympics and stuff, you know, so, I mean, I'm fit and I'm lucky because I got pretty good DNA. I really do think genetics, when it comes to conditioning and, and, uh, and, and your, your body, I think have a lot to do with it, you know, because, um, you know, I had to have a hip replaced uh, in 2012. And once they put that in there, you know, I was good to go. You know, it's like things wear out, put another thing in, you know, your, your desire as a human being, you know, how much does that play into it? You know, you want to stay in shape, you know. Um, and, it, and it's easy to eat right nowadays because there's so much information out there. Um, you know, and if you want to be in condition to play, you know, there, there's really no excuse not to. You know, that's the way I look at it. So that's what we do, man, Steve. I mean, I think all the guys think about, you know, um, pulling off a two, three-hour show. <laughs> they think about it before they go out there. They get themselves ready. They do. Now, the, the last, when I saw you the last time, you um, I, th I think I saw you the Friday night. Um, you yeah. had a great drum solo. When, when, Thank you. What, what, like, what, how do you create a drum solo? Are you just doing it on the fly? Is it ad-libbed or is it something you practice? Because you, you never yeah. know. Yeah, I, I, I have a couple things that I, I have. of your career is you were on TV you are on the Goldbergs how, how did that come about and what was that what was yeah. that like oh that was so much fun man not only that just like to hang in LA with the guys meeting the people that do the show and the, the, the producer director um, hey man I can tell you, you gotta love, yesterday I got a, I got paid for, a, for one of the shows yesterday it was kind of cool um, you know because it runs in syndication um um so yeah, that was just a great, um, a great thing to be asked to, to be a part of. You know, they're they're really nice people, and and and, the, and we you know when we read the script, you know, it's so funny. We, we you know we filmed that at the Wilton Theater, and we you know you, you, there's a lot to there's so much involved with just thirty seconds of of, of, of winter because you barely see us. We're at the end of the show, and it's based on you know um, I think. I think that the daughter, um, you know, was a, was a fan or something like that. I, I, and, and and at the very end, you see us, and we're all wearing, we have our wigs on, and we have a blonde wig on. And uh, at the very end of the performance, my head, my, my, 
my head spins off. My, the wig actually does <laughs> kind of flip off my head. And if you look close enough, you can see it. Man, it, it, it was a total gas doing that. It was great. Now, in, was cool. in that, you were wearing the uh, yellow. What was, you guys all used to have colors. How did that How did that come about? And why didn't you wear Phillies reds or Eagles green? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. I, see, I just happen to like the color yellow. I do like it. I mean, people say, how'd you end up yellow? I said, I like the color, man. I had, a, I had a yellow drum set. I had a I had a Volkswagen. I just like it. It makes me feel good, man. And, um, but it was, look, when, when a color thing happened, it was the 80s. So you, you look at some of the styles in the 80s, you know, it was, uh, that might have been a suggestion of somebody um, that was doing kind of style stuff. And we went, okay, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a little hook. So, um, you know, we, we did that for a little bit. And then, then it wore out, you know, like anything else. But yeah, it was, it was something we did. Well, before we go, I got to ask you, once this pandemic and stay at home all happens and we shit gets back normal, what do you want to do musically? What do you, what, I mean, you know, besides playing with the Hooters and hopefully you will get across the season because, and I want to see you guys next uh, November too. Hopefully you'll, you know, yeah. what, what, are, what are your plans? What would you like to do? Build the, in the pocket, build the bar band. What are your goals? Well, I have, well, um, I, I tell you what, I'm actually recording. A, I'm recording something on Friday. That's going to be a, a lot of fun. I'm actually recording something with uh, for Phil Niccolo and Obi O'Brien. I'm excited about. Um, but it, you know, like it's it, you have to do everything on your own. So I'm recording a track that they have. I'm looking forward to that. And it's just this week. Um, but once this thing is over, as far as. Um, you know, just playing. I mean, we have some gigs that I'm hoping that we could pull off. It, you know, we, we, the, the, in the pocket, we're supposed to play, um, and it's still scheduled because we don't know what's going to happen in August under the stars there in, in Valley Forge Park. It's just always a lot of fun. We did it last year. I'm really hoping that will happen. And you know, the, the, the you know, getting together with the Hooters and 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 playing and just you know, seeing through what, what was planned this year. I mean. Obviously, those things are changing, but man, you know, it was really going to be an exciting year for us playing music. You know, these old old dudes hitting it again. You know, so um, that's what I'm most looking forward to. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, you and Kenny and the bar band should do some of those uh, live Facebook shows. I saw the uh, Giuliano brothers do one. They did a happy hour uh, from their garage, and man, there was like 2,500 viewers. You guys should do that. People would uh, eat it up. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna see what we, we, we know. Depending how long this goes, we're gonna try and think of something. I was invited to do something, and it just didn't seem right. You know, like I, I, I you know, I've been called. You know, I'm just, I'm waiting to to see what the right fit is. So yeah, yeah it's always something to play. In. I love those guys, Giuliani Brothers. Man, they are so great and um, such good guys. Uh, you know, uh, just just think they're the best. So I, I, I'm going to go check it out. I guess I can go to the website and see that, right? Yeah, they do. I think they do it. Uh, they do it on their Facebook page Friday. I think at five or six. I just have. I had never seen them. My friend raves about them, and I just oh, went. They and are it was, great. It, I, I I was an honorary Juliana brother one night. They asked me to sub for them, so I played drums. Uh, and uh, Michael had an injury, and he called me up. He goes, "Would you play drums?" So I played with them, and it was so much fun. They're so good. They're so good, such great people. So, well, man, you know. I want to I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Give all your where tell, tell everyone where people can find you. Well, you know, I'm I'm, I'm you know Facebook David Osikin and U O S I K K I N E N David, and then if Twitter, I'm just uh, D, uh, uh, again David Osikin D Osikin and U O S I K K I N E N, and I have an Instagram page, same thing. And uh, songsinthepocket.org, you can check out all the uh, in-the-pocket stuff. And, um, you know, you on a T-shirt, you want to buy a record, it's all there. Get it. <laughs> so, people, yo, go check out Dave's site. Go check out In The Pocket. It is great, and it's fun. They had a great video when I went to see him with Patty Smythe was in it. They sang Expressway to the Heart, yeah. I believe. And it was just great. Oh, so, yeah. So, yeah, so people, check out David. Check out the Hooters. Go go. Download yeah. their music. Pay for it. Uh, check out my website, coopertalk.net. 
You can find yeah. over 788 episodes, I believe. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. Twitter, I'm at coopertalk1. And now I just started a Facebook page. I had it, but I never posted on it. So look up Cooper Talk Radio and like it on Facebook. Oh. So people, I'm Steve I'm Cooper. I'm going to do that right now. Great. Well, okay, people. So check out the people. I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you next time.